Our scripture reading today is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the gospel of the Lord. You, Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we continue our sermon series, Testify to the Truth. And this is what uh, Jesus told Pontius Pilate uh, when po Pontius Pilate was asking him, about who he was. Jesus said, I was born to testify to the truth. And uh, in this sermon series, we are listening uh, to the truths that Jesus is telling us. And today we are looking at uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. So this story uh, is repeated in all the three synoptic Gospels, in all of them. So Gospel of Luke, Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark are telling us this, uh, this story, uh, this encounter between a young man uh, or young ruler and Jesus. And we need to understand that this encounter is happening on Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to be crucified. He's going to Jerusalem to die on the cross 
uh, for our sins. And on his way, on his journey to Jerusalem, uh, several things happen. And one of them is this encounter. And uh, in the light of what, what I've just told, what I've just said, let us look at this encounter. Um, well, the, the, the question is, the first question is, is this man or young man, young ruler, is he a good guy or a bad guy in the story? Is he a good guy or a bad guy? Is he someone who is uh, not good enough or on the contrary, he is someone who is trying to do his best and is better, in fact, better more than other people around him. Well, he is a good guy. He is a good guy. We see that he uh, ran up and knelt before Jesus. What does it mean? It means that this young man recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Messiah. He kneels before him. You kneel only before God. Right? And then we have this very strange conversation, very strange interaction. He says, good teacher, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, he recognizes that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ. The Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And it may seem here that Jesus is not kind of happy that this man is calling him good. But in reality, Jesus affirms that what this man thinks about him is correct, that Jesus in truly is the Messiah and that Jesus is God. When he says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. This is a statement from Jesus in the form of a question that says, yes, you are right. I'm the Messiah. I'm God. I'm the good teacher. Okay? And then, uh, and then, and then uh, follows a conversation between a human a man and God. And this is just so amazing because at that moment, God, you know, the second person of the Trinity, he's incarnate. He has a body, human body. And you are able to talk to God like face to face. And this is just amazing. This man is talking to God himself. Now, why it is important? Why we have this story in the gospel? Well, it's because each of us, you and me, we are those humans who will have and are having a conversation with God all the time. We are this young man. We are this young ruler. Each of us. Okay? So now let us look closely at what they're talking about. This is very interesting. Now, Jesus is God. We don't forget about that. And he says to this man, you know the commandments. And it's interesting that Jesus, he looks right because he is God and he knows everything. He looks right into the heart of this, of this guy. And he diagnoses, uh, di uh, so he diagnoses, he makes a diagnosis of his condition. So we human beings, we don't have that ability. Maybe we can read people psychologically and just make, to you know, we may come to certain conclusions, but only God can look right into your heart and see what is lacking, what you need. What is the true state of your heart? And, and, and Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. Jesus knows that this man is trying to live as a good person, as a good Jew. That he is trying to follow and uh, fulfill all the commandments. You know the commandments. 
Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And then the guy, this man, said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And he's not lying. He's been trying to keep all of them. And now Jesus, he knows the heart of this man. And he says, yeah, you know the commandments. You know all that. You are trying to live this good life, like as, as this uh, uh, honorable life, virtuous life. You, 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 you are d doing everything I commanded you, but then Jesus says something else. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. And again, it's not Jesus just making theoretical conclusions. You need to, uh, we need to understand that he's able to look inside of us, inside of our heart, and tell us exactly what the state of our heart is. You lack one thing. Because Jesus knows that all the other commandments, well, this guy didn't steal, this guy didn't, you know, didn't commit adultery, uh, did not bear false witness. He, he's, he's kind of like a good guy. You lack one thing, Jesus says. Go sell all that you have and give you to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Wow. This is a huge challenge to this man. So I think we, this is a huge challenge to each of us. If Jesus today told you, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, just empty your saving accounts, empty your checking accounts, just sell everything, give it to the poor. And then come, follow me. Would you do that? Would that be difficult to you, honestly speaking? Without any security, financial security. But what would I do? What if I get old or disabled? Or what if I lose my job? So it's impossible, right? It's, 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 it's impossible. Well, here we see several things going on. So first, Jesus loved him. Jesus is not trying to be mean to him. Jesus is not poking him. Jesus is not just attacking him like uh, vainly. Jesus loved him. Jesus loves. And what Jesus says, it's out of love. And the word love here is, of course, agapao, which means divine sacrificial love. It's not just like your brotherly love or any type of love that is uh, about human relationship. It's divine love. It's sacrificial love. God is good. He never wants to take advantage of you. He never wants. We, we, we know that about. We, we know that uh, from the very beginning of this conversation that God is good. And the word good, of course, in Greek, it's agathos, which means it's morally good. God will never just, you know, try to. If you're weak, he will not push you. If you are uh, stupid, he would not make fun of you. If you are poor, he would not try to take away something from, from you. God is good. And Jesus loved him. And Jesus tells him the truth. And this is not how we understand today love. And today's culture would tell us, if you love someone, accept them as they are. And this is how you show your love. Your child tells them that they want X. And you need to embrace that. And this is how you show them that you love your children. Because this is how the culture teaches us to demonstrate our love. And if you tell your child that this X or Y or Z or anything they choose is wrong, you are not loving. Because you are supposed to affirm and accept and embrace everything they feel or like is okay. But Jesus... 
In this particular case, his divine love and divine goodness manifests itself in the fact that he is telling the truth to this young man. And he says, you lack one thing. And then it looks as if he says something impossible. But here there is another thing I want you to pay attention to something before we move on. He says, when you give what you have, you will have treasure in heaven. And this idea, this concept of treasure in heaven, this is amazing because we keep seeing in the scriptures that spiritual stuff and stuff that is related to God is invisible. It is not tangible, but we, you and I, we live in this world that is surrounded by tangible stuff. We know that we need a car, we need a house, you know, you need to go to the doctor, you need money, you need to go to work. Okay, so all these invisible things, they, they, we need faith, right, to, to, to trust God. Otherwise, they go against our, our um, reason and against our feelings. But here he says, you sell everything, you give it to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Now, I have a question to you. Do you have treasure in heaven? Are you collecting treasure in heaven? I know that we are used to collect treasure here, right? So we put aside some money, we collect money, we collect. And, you know, do not be confused by these words treasure, wealth, and rich in this text. Because basically the Greek words mean uh, possession and stuff. So when we talk about wealth and being rich or wealth in this text, you know, it's not about being a billionaire. It's not about, you know, Bill Gates. It's not about that kind of money. It's about just having stuff, right? So you know that 80% of people in the world live on less than $10 a day. So if you live on more than $10 a day, you are rich. You, you may not think so. You may think, uh, I need more. You know, but 80%, 87% of population lives, they live on less than $10 a day. And then 10% of the population in the world, they live on less than $2 a day, right? So, so what the Greek text says, people who have stuff, you know, if we have stuff, we are wealthy, we are rich, biblically speaking. So, now, do we have treasure in heaven? Yeah, we know, we, we want to save money, we want to buy a house, we want to have, you know, our equity to grow, we are happy when our houses go up in price. Oh, well, you know, yeah, that gives me security, financial security. We have financial advisors, you know, who tell us how to invest, all those things. We know how to collect treasure or stuff or money here on earth. But my question is, do we have treasure in heaven? Do you, do I, do we have treasure in heaven? Jesus is very specific. Well, when Paul is uh, talking about our citizen, citizenship in heaven and say 1 Corinthians, he talk about us, you know, working for God, you know, he talks about rewards. He talks about crowns. And Jesus is talking about treasure in heaven. So now I can give you an example. A guy, uh, so he wasn't very rich, but he decided to give half of his possessions uh, to donate it to an orphanage. And his wife was not happy with his decision because it was a lot. And then it happened so that because of economic crisis, it's a true story. It's a true story. Because of the economic crisis, they lost everything they had. And now his wife tells him, Look, you gave like so much to that orphanage and now we lost this, we lost that and now we lost this. And he was a Christian man and he said, no, I believe that what I didn't give to the orphanage, I lost. But what I gave to the orphanage is in heaven. So that, this is my treasure in heaven. Are we contributing to the kingdom of God? Are we collecting treasure in heaven? This is a big question which we need to, have, to, to ask ourselves. Okay, and then Jesus says, come, follow me. Now, the big question is, is it possible at all to do what Jesus was asking of this young man? If we go to the end of the story, we see that 
Peter, he says, well, we left everything and we followed you. So we see that the apostles, they were able to do this. And it's interesting what Jesus answers Peter, you know, when, when Peter talks about leaving everything and following Jesus. Okay, so he is disheartened by this saying, but what Jesus said to him. And he went away sorrowful. And it's not just like unhappy or sad. He was deeply wounded. He was grieving. For he had great possessions. And the word possessions here in Greek, it means land. He had a lot of land. And now Jesus tells him to sell all of that and give it to the poor. It is impossible. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth. And here wealth means stuff. So, and back then, if you have like a nice coat and if you have a house, you're already super rich, right? So, and if you have a horse, like extremely rich. So we, we, have, we have wealth. People in, the, in, in, in this country, most of us, we have wealth. And then Jesus says something really two times he, he repeats this uh, truth. And, and, and this is God himself saying, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For us, difficult. And difficult, uh, again, so the Greek word means when you try to squeeze something through a very narrow, you know, opening, you try to push it and it doesn't go, you know, it's, it's difficult. Why is it difficult for us? Why Jesus is saying this? And the disciples were amazed at his words. And again, translators, use, they use this word amazed. The word is terrified. They were terrified. They were scared. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is for those who trust in riches, in stuff, in possessions to enter the kingdom of God. And then they are terrified again. And then, you know, Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person, person who has stuff, to enter the kingdom of God. Like the third time. It's difficult, right? It's difficult. Well, we can interpret it differently. It, you know, the text says the eye of the needle and camel, so it can be like a thread that is made of camel, uh, camel uh, hair. Uh, it's basically like really thick. Or there is another interpretation. Jerusalem had a gate which was called uh, the eye uh, of the needle, like this is a picture of this, like really, really narrow. So a camel cannot go through that gate, you know. It's, it's difficult. It's impossible. Difficult, impossible. And see, you know, disciples, they again were exceedingly astonished. And again, the word in Greek means terrified. They're terrified. He scares them. And then they said to him, who can be saved then? If I tell you today, give away everything you have, sell it to the poor, would you be able to do that, honestly? And the answer, the answer is no, you wouldn't be, right? You wouldn't be able. Nobody would be able to do this. Today, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come and follow Jesus. Okay, so now, then who can be saved? Let us go back to the image of this guy. You know, he is a nice young guy. He is a truly pious, virtuous guy. He loves God. He recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. We know many people hated Jesus, wouldn't recognize him as the Messiah. He's a very positive character. And he's rich. 
And as a rich person, we know rich people, rich virtuous people in the Jewish culture, they would give money to the poor on a regular basis. They would make donations and they would buy food for the people. I mean, he, he, he's a benefactor. He's a philanthropist. Okay? He's not just keeping the money to himself. We know that. Right? Because he keeps all the commandments. But he's not willing to give everything he has. Because what Jesus was doing, he was challenging him. Give everything you have. And this guy cannot do this. And then the question is then, who can be saved? Okay, you think that you are a good person. And that you are living a good Christian life. You are a good Christian and God kind of likes it. God is pleased with you because you're not a criminal. You are not somebody who commits adultery. You're a good person. And even if you have a little bit of money, you are willing to donate, you know, chip in, you know, here and there. You're a good person. You give to the church. You may buy something to a poor, you know, person, lady who, who is in need. But, but, but this is, was the guy in the picture. And Jesus says, uh, no, no. You cannot be saved. And, and, then, and then the disciples, they were terrified because of that. Then nobody can be saved. Who can be saved? And what Jesus says. And Jesus looked at them. Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible. Well, it is impossible. It is impossible to be saved with man. And then he says, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. And now we need to remember when this encounter happens. It's when Jesus goes to Jerusalem to be crucified, to die for us. Jesus, he was able to give everything, including his life, for us. He, he gave everything he had. He left his heaven, his throne. He left everything behind. And he gave his life for us. He suffered. You know, he's on the way to Jerusalem. Jesus is teaching us about this. He's teaching us about the cross. He's saying, yeah, you think that you're a good person? You think that you're a good Christian? And yesterday I had a conversation with a good uh, Christian, uh, wise, good cr uh, Christian woman uh, who is um, an advanced, uh, in her advanced years. And she told me that she's thinking about the judgment. She told me, well, I think <clears throat> if I stand before the Lord, how it will be. She truly, she thinks about the, the judgment. She says, well, I think that he will show me first all my bad deeds, all my wrong actions. And she said, and she said, and I would feel ashamed. I would feel shame. But then she said, I think that he also will show me my good deeds. And I hope that my good deeds will outnumber the bad deeds. But then also, in our conversation, we were speaking about that he also will show us Jesus on the cross on that day. Because with man it's impossible. What Jesus is telling us, you cannot be saved without me. You cannot be saved without God. And then what happens next? He enters Jerusalem and they beat him and they spit on him and <clears throat> they torture him and they crucify him. And he didn't have to endure all that because unlike us, he is sinless. He is perfect. He's absolutely obedient to the Father. He, 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 he doesn't deserve to be punished in that way. And still he does that. And this is how he shows us his love. Isn't that amazing? And then Peter. 
began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And they did. They did. And Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. And he's talking now about something amazing. He's talking about his church. He's talking about his church. And I understand that in our today's culture, we want to be independent. We want to be independent financially. We want to have our own house, our own room, our own car. We want to be completely independent. But the church of Christ is designed by God in such a way that we are supposed to be dependent on one another. We, are we need fellowship. We are one body. We need one another. And this is what Jesus says. You abandon your house, but then you receive a hundredfold houses. And he doesn't mean that you become a mogul. You become a, a, a business person who owns hundreds of houses. He's not talking about that. He says, well, now you become part of the church. But can you trust the church? Can you trust those people? Can you trust them? That is a completely different question why we cannot trust one another. This is a completely different... That just shows how wrong something is in our churches. But the thing is that once you leave everything behind and you start following Jesus, then you are connected to this network that is called his church. And then you have houses and you have brothers and you have sisters and you have mothers and also you have persecutions. It's also included in the package. And then you have children. But this is not how we think, right? We think about my house, my money, my car, my family, my children, right? We don't think about church. So it, it's, it's, it just shows that we and Jesus, we think differently, you know. And since Jesus is the truth, uh, it means that we, our thinking is false, you know. But in any event... And Jesus says, and th then the conclusion, the pinnacle, and in the age to come, will receive eternal life. And you, you remember what was the first question of that young man to Jesus? How can I inherit eternal life? And here Jesus lays out the entire plan of salvation and shows his love. And he shows that without him it's impossible. And that you need him completely. And that he's willing to pay this price. And that he paid this price on the cross. And this is how he showed us love. That he loved us first. He loved us while we were still sinners. And without God is impossible. But with God everything is possible. And salvation is possible. And then he says, now you follow me and don't be afraid. Because if you follow me, you will receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters, and, but most importantly, eternal life. And tell me, please, today, uh, neighbors may live in one area and not know one another, not talk to one another. Family members may not be well connected, right? So, uh, what is one of the biggest problems in this age? Anxiety and depression that comes from loneliness. People are alone. They don't have friends. They live in virtual reality. I mean, virtual computer reality, not real life. You know, all those things, y y y you see, th they create problems. And Jesus has a solution for us Christians. You need brother? Church. You need sister? Church. You need father? Church. You need child? Church. And if you don't have your own children or brothers and sisters, if you are not connected, here is your new family. 
I love this text so much. I imagine that I'm that young man. And I invite you to imagine that you are that person, and that you are having this conversation with, with Jesus. And at first, it seems as if there is no hope because Jesus presents this truth to us. Go and sell everything you have. And we cannot. And we are grieving. And then he says, but with me it's possible. And I will save you. And that gives us comfort and peace and joy and shows us how God loves us. And then he says, well, here is my church. This is where you have, you will have everything you need. Just mind-blowing. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your word, for your truth. We thank you so much for teaching us that it doesn't matter how good we are or how pious we are, we still cannot save ourselves. We need you, we need a savior. We, we recognize Jesus that you died for us and we trust you. We have faith in you. We believe that you died for us and that by, gr um, uh, by grace through faith, we will be saved. We glorify you. We glorify your love, magnify your love. And at the same time, Jesus, we know that you called us to follow you and to assess our priority and to find our satisfaction and everything in your body, in the church. And it's so difficult and we're confused and we don't have that kind of experience, but we trust that your Holy Spirit and we ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us to convict us, to encourage us, to lead us into every truth so that we may not live according to our own ideas, false ideas, but according to your truth as it is expressed in your, in your word. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Crown him.